welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from... Coming to us straight from uh, from the Misty Isles, from the Misty Isles themselves, and developer of the upcoming Curse of Camelot, the one and only Eric Smith. Oh, thank you for having me on. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> oh. what should we talk about? <laughs> so <laughs> let me let me uh, let me start with the let me start with the easy let me start with the um. Not the easy part, but I'll start with the bad jokes, given the location listed on the Kickstarter page. From your perspective, is Atlanta traffic as as bad as I always hear? It's even worse. Uh, construction everywhere. It takes an hour to get from Atlanta to Atlanta, and we even had Georgia's Department of Transfer or Transportation tell us to stay home and not use the highway, so it's as bad as you think. Yeah, I've, I've been in some debates about, what, about whether... Um, Atlanta traffic is the worst, or um, LA traffic is the worst. Ooh, I've only driven LA a couple times, and I'm not curious enough to say. But first of being biased, I would say it's Atlanta. It's uh, always a wreck. Always count on the major highways to be uh, trap uh, parking lots. Try not to drive if you don't have to. So mm. I vote Atlanta. For LA people, would vote LA. Um. Can I vote for the nuke? Yeah, I okay. can. Uh, maybe that could give us sort of permanent remote uh, work from home. Uh, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'd flip off both. I would flip off both cities. Uh, I've no, had... I would, I would not have to drive in Atlanta, so. So let me. So getting onto the meat of things, let me. I'd like to go into the origin story, if you will. So walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. For me personally or for Curse of Camelot in itself? Um, for you. Okay, so I started playing uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd uh, edition when I was in uh, early high school. And uh, it was just a group of friends. And uh, I think also my friends who they had started playing because their parents and older siblings had uh, been playing some of the earlier editions. So got absorbed into it quickly and uh, moved through the editions with a, a brief pit stop in 4th edition and then came to 5th edition uh, not too long ago, maybe uh, five or six years ago. And uh, our friends and I have just loved it, always had continuous homebrewed campaigns. And uh, more recently, we kind of all just started taking a break from uh, D&D and exploring what else has been out there. So it's been a, it's been a journey trying to you know, find the game that really suits us and you know, I, since I've normally been the, the game master for my group of friends, uh, I always try to come up with uh, different games to introduce to them or come up with some of my own. And uh, Curse of Camelot was uh, an attempt to bring uh, a game to my friends uh, using a D6 system that was simple, with minimal prep, go ahead and get into the game. And uh, they all loved it. And so we moved from there. And then you know, a lot of work later, here we are with a, a game that we're trying to release on Kickstarter. Mm hmm so, Camelot and just and just Arthurian myth has has a, has a whole lot of angles that that you can go with. Um, Absolutely. In if it obviously the big the big one the definitive one for a lot of people is going to be La Morte d'Arthur. Wow, that's real bad French. Um, <laughs> that I'm that good. is that is the patient zero for a, for a lot of. A lot of what people think of when it comes to a when it comes to a Thurian myth, but there's been other interpretations. Um, I remember a big one that I delved into back in high school, and I've revisited when I talked about Pendragon, was Myths of Avalon, which has which focuses far more on the supernatural end of things. And there's been various ones that go, that go that go somewhere in between. With with Curse of Camelot, are you aiming for? Um, Arthurian myth in a dark fantasy sense, as the name implies, or what? Or what was the appendix end for it? I've really tried to 
Yeah, there's many of the sources I can. I can't say that I'm particularly tied to one as my definite information. I tried to make this a little unique and put a different spin of Arthur's now the bad guy. Uh, there are storyline elements that I'll definitely not give away any spoilers here, but Arthur and uh, his knights have gone on a lot of their legendary quests. Uh, Gawain has already faced the Green Knight. The knights have already returned from uh, searching for the Grail. I'm sure that'll be told in the story. But after they've come back and uh, they're already have completed a lot of their quests, now that something has happened and they have turned the realm of Camelot into just the place of despair and tyranny and have turned on a lot of the people they were friends with before. So I tried to come with a what could happen next, kind of my own uh, hopefully unique uh, sequel to a lot of the text out there. But obviously in my case, uh, Arthur has not been slain by Mordred. Uh, he's still out and about and he'll be the, the villain in this game. So I can't say that I stuck to one particular source, tried to compile as many as I can, make as many quests as I can out there, combine them into one storyline. The After Effects new. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Uh, I was a bit I I was a bit curious if if um at the start of the setting as you have it if more if Mordred is is um active by that point. Um yeah, so uh I guess I feel like I can answer this one since it happens at the very beginning. I'm not going to be spoiled much. Um so the way I kind of have it in this is that uh Arthur left to search for the Grail with a host of knights and uh, left some behind. Uh, I have my story left Lancelot behind to rule with Guinevere and Merlin. And Arthur comes back and there's a really dark night where Arthur betrays a lot of the people and there's a lot of public execution. I go over that in my introduction. But Mordred is a, uh, a knight who escaped that uh, dark night in Camelot. And in the game, you play as allies of Mordred who are helping him in the rebellion against Arthur. But very shortly into the first quest, uh, Mordred is the one who is defeated and essentially taken out. And it's up to you to take on his mantle and lead the fight against Arthur. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind... I will I will note that one of the first things that came to mind with that description was the game Tainted Grail. But I'm but there's uh, but there's other angles that can be that can be considered as well. Um Now this is a now this is a game that it given given what you mentioned I'm guessing that a lot that um a lot of the more fey aspects of the Athurian legend aren't going to be as present in this interpretation. It's more focused on the knights themselves as kind of the wardens and executioners and uh, people carrying out author's tyranny, but there is a bit of the fey. Um, I do go into, uh, try to be vague and avoid uh, spoilers, I guess, but going into Merlin's tomb, where that is, find it. Um, Morgan Le Fay, uh, Vivian, those creatures are the, those uh, sorceresses. Uh, I do have, so there are some fey creatures that you'll come across in the modules, monsters, uh, some adventures that kind of go out of Camelot to other realms. It's a minor part of the story, but there is a small part of it there. But for the vast majority, it is focused kind of the knights. And... All right, I can get, I can get behind that. So, with that in mind, you you of all the dice systems, you guys you went with a d6 base. Now, if I'm not mistaken, all roads lead to 2d6. Like that is that is going to be the primary resolution mechanic that you have. Am I correct? Yes. Uh, we are. Yeah, it's essentially a 2d6 system, but there are ways to manipulate the number of dice you roll. But you'll always be keeping two dice on. So is it a case where some, where some effects are going to have a roll three, drop one? Yes. So players can gain access to abilities both to bump themselves up or benefit themselves by maybe rolling three dice, you know, drop one, so you have your highest uh, D2, or you can inflict a penalty upon an enemy to where they may roll three, drop the highest. 
There's also environmental factors such as like high ground or whether you're hiding or other factors that are described on the page by page uh, for a scenario that could give you a bonus, give you a bonus or you know, you're giving yeah. yeah, so you could you could end up rolling five dice, drop three your highest two. Yeah. Now as I understand it, you use you are utilizing classes, but it looks like you're using a kind of upgrade tree with the, with um, ability perks. Is that accurate? And could you go into how abilities and ability perks work for um, characters and character classes? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, it, cl classes, characters are kind of synonymous. They're pretty synonymous in this game. Where I have Agravain as the knight, the warrior. Uh, and Morgana as the the mage and Dagone as the rogue. So you won't be Agravain and be a rogue. You'll be Agravain who is the. And if if we do hit uh, some of our stretch goals, we'll have six more characters trying to add some diversity to the game. Yes, every uh, every character has a list of abilities that they uh, could pick from, and they are they are a couple that are shared throughout the uh, the characters, such as movement speed, things of that nature, but each character has specific abilities like uh, Aggravain the Knight may have like power attack or shield bash. Um, Morgana the Mage may have like far spell to increase the range of her spells or an effective spell that would a certain spell type her enemies take dice negatives like if they were to be rolling their 2d6 and she has this ability a may now have to roll 3d6 and drop the highest when she's casting a certain type of spell. Mm -hmm. And then Dagone, the rogue, will have uh, abilities that help him sneak past. So rolling the like, attribute to sneak past someone or to use his poisons more effectively. So you have abilities that give you bonuses or give you bonuses or inflict penalties upon your opponents. And there are rankings in this game. Each ability has three rankings and it's essentially rank one is your lowest bonus, rank two is a higher bonus for inflicting a penalty, and then rank three is your highest. So each time you take a new tier rank in the ability, your ability becomes more lethal or productive, however you want. Mm -hmm. Now, with now with that in with that in mind, uh, if somebody was to boot this up, what would they ha would they um have to play as the th as if they wanted to be a knight would they have to play as um Agravain, or are you going to be putting in character creation rules proper the way we have now you would be you would be Agravain, unless we have our bonus characters but then you would you would be the name associated with the the class it's the the, the game's really meant for one to three players uh, as it stands right now, so you yeah. just would update system to... The I goal think, was more for simplicity and minimal prep. Uh, I, th yeah. I think what I was curious about is what is whether or not um, character creation is going to is going to be reliant on the on these three as um, pregens, in a sense. Mm. Yeah, we, we've... It's pretty much uh, just we give you the character to go ahead and pick and then pick their abilities from there. Um, you, but there are not enough perks in the game to uh, pick all the abilities. So once you pick, uh, like let's say you were to pick Aggravain, who is the knight, you could you can really kind of customize him that way between a uh, two-handed weapon with like a great, a great hammer, great club, or you could do that you could uh, choose to run like the sword and shield route, or you could be a like increased increased movement mobile ranged fighter. So each of the characters kind of have a little bit of a custom customization within them, but you're you're still just one of the three characters. Mm -hmm. Now, some games that utilize a two d six approach will have some extra effect if you roll box cars or snake or snake eyes. Do you have a similar thing going on? No, we have a. Uh, if you roll twelve, then you roll twelve. If you roll uh, two, then you roll two. There's effects in here that 
when you roll higher, you get certain benefits or you lose certain penalties out of other people, but there are no special uh, benefits to uh, rolling the, the 12 or the 2. Mm -hmm. One exception is uh, there is one weapon in the game that uh, you may come across that upon rolling the 12 has a pretty lethal ability that the players may not like if they face, but other than that, a, a 12 is a and would it be fair of me to say that most of the most of the die rolls present are going to be are going to be contested, or do you have some cases where you're going to be rolling against a um, set difficulty value? Yeah. So enemies, uh, the players will also have this. The enemies will have a defense score that you could kind of say is similar to armor class. It's a static number. Uh, it can be influenced if. Uh, for example, enemies could have armor, and if uh, one of the poisons the rogue can use corrode the armor, which are useless and lowers their defense score. But defense scores are static, and they're mentioned in the stat blocks, and you're rolling your attack rolls against those. Um, if you're responding to a spell or uh, trying to hide or look or search for someone or responding to a poison, then rolls are con two, two d6 rolls are con All right, I can. All right, I can get with that. Now, within the full, within the full book, within the full book, because I'm get, I'm guessing that you will have a f you will have a few story seeds to kind of uh, move pe move people along the ad the adventure. Uh, you're saying, will I have a, a story to move people? I just want to make sure. No, story seeds, i.e. ideas that a GM can t can take to expand upon, but they're not. But they're not meant to. They're not meant to be any anything more than a paragraph. Oh, okay. Yeah. So between each uh, each quest does have a conclusion and like an introduction. That's how did you get here? What happens after you're done? Trying to illustrate the story setup. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing we are trying to do. Uh, it's in our stretch goals, and we'll hopefully get to release a lot of these. But we have uh, side quests that um, we're, we're not—they're not going to be in the printed form of the book because they'll be more. Uh, I'll say I'll say heavier role play than the, the game. The map, the game book itself is. While there is some role playing in there, most of the adventures have the game maps. There are some that are like investigation type, or like one you're in a tavern and you're. Uh, maneuvering around and you get to pick what you think your character would want to do but the side quests would be in between and they are more uh you want to call them ethical decisions or what you think your character might actually do you want to rescue this person do you not so hopefully having those would allow a uh, am if they wanted to run this for a group to use those to kind of play around uh with more some more role play but the book is written that a gm is not needed so a player could play itself wouldn't want to stop a GM from running their group on it. Yeah, and I'm guessing that even w even with those adventures, there's still ways to to um to go to go along different paths to the same destination. I.e., um, making sure that things aren't railroaded. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So for the uh, the linear adventure, we we do have the the maps that uh executive pages. I would I would think it's fair to say that this is a fairly linear adventure. At least the main storyline is mm -hmm. um, you have to go from one page to the next, and the the story guides you uh, to from one page to the next. There are a couple adventures to where there are multiple ways to go through the quest, but most of them are largely you go from one page to the next, and the story takes you from map. All right, I can I can certainly get behind that. Now, let's talk. Let's talk about spell casting. So, I think the obviously one obviously one of the characters is going is going to be a mage, but when it comes to spell casting, is it treat is it treated as ju as just another two d six check, or are there certain rules that have to be applied when it comes to when it comes to using magic? Oh, only one character in the base. Uh, game can use magic and that'd be the mage and what a lot what the uh mage will do is the mage will cast a spell and 
person who is on the receiving end, usually an enemy, will will make their 2d6 roll to respond. And based on the roll, there's prescribed outcomes. Um, there are some spells that aren't against enemies that allow the, uh, the caster to you know, do various things to buff their enemies or help them move. Uh, like, for example, the caster could have invisibility or uh, foresight to help them maneuver through the battlefield. But when it's going against an enemy, it's it's always going to come down to a 2d6 roll. Mm -hmm. So, with that now, with that in mind, uh, even even with the linear nature of of some of the adventures, is advancement similarly set, or are you le are you having a milestone like advancement where where characters will be able to upgrade abilities at the GM's call? So there's a stipulation in the game. There's ten chapters. Uh, call the chapters quest if you like the 10 chapters in the book and there's a stipulation for the players to get to pick up one ability perk uh at the end of each chapter so you'll essentially gain a either a new ability or a rank higher in one of your abilities at the end of each quest and there are a couple times in the book where you get to have permanent attribute bonus uh, uh dice so a tribute would be like athletic or cunning resolve or intuition uh, there's only four. It's kind of simplified from you know, your strength, dex, con, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Mm -hmm. It's down to four, and there's typically abilities are for get bonuses to those attribute roles in certain situations. Um, but there are, I believe, two in the book, if I'm not mistaken, as of right now. The side quests could uh, impact that. But there are two times where you get a permanent increase to all situations where that attribute is uh, used. But Essentially, long, long answer short, going through the game, you quote unquote level up, level up by getting a new ability perk. All right, all right, I can get, I can certainly get that. Especially since the, the way the the way the characters were laid out and what you sent me, um, had it appear that th that each character has a kind a kind of ability tree set I think is the best way for me to put it that, that's correct yeah that's a that's a good way to put it um so you pick an ability and it, so let's say you have let's call it ability one mm -hmm. that uh gives you a plus in a certain situation and then you finish quest and you now have an ability perk you can choose to take the second rank of ability one or you could choose to take on ability two for the first rank of ability two so you could you know, have two ranks of ability two, or a, one rank of ability one, of ability two. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, a, it's a way for you to, if you think, oh, well, this ability is very important for me, I need to max it out as soon as I can. You have that freedom. If you think, oh, maybe I should just have all or as many abilities as I can get, you won't be able to max them all out, but you won't even be able to get close to that number of uh, ability perks. To Game, but you could try to be a, a jack of all trades well, by being low level and well, it's cer it's certainly a possibility. I'm not sure if I would go with with that personally because because um, jack of all trades has its um, costs. Especially as for since, yeah, yeah. oh sorry, especially since especially since some. Um, We've seen we've seen what happens when somebody wants to be a jack of all trades in a um, in in the sen in the sense of say the bard. Yeah. So in in this game, I would I would personally recommend, and the way I tried to test it, and I test it this way whenever I'd get to people, friends or other uh, volunteer testers to test it. I would. Try to encourage, but not railroad people to try to max something out because your enemies' bonuses will progress as well to the end. Find yourself not maxing some abilities out, may not have that great of an area to compete against your enemy. So, I personally recommend maxing some out, but like for anyone who tries to play the game to do what they want, enjoyment out. 
I can I can certainly get that. Now, what are you sh now when it comes to the page count for the project? I know I know this is one of those things that's tricky to nail down because of stretch goals and the like. But what are you shooting for as far as a page count? As of right now, our uh, our print version is 110 pages. Um, I don't see that changing. However, the stretch goals would help a supplemental PDF. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that if we were to hit all of our stretch goals, that that would be like an additional 50 page PDF um, with you know the side quest, the bonus characters. One of the PDF, one of the stretch goals that I think is a pretty neat game is alternate maps. So the alternate maps wouldn't be in the print version. But if for anyone who has played the game and they're like, well, I always get to this map and I know that if I turn left, I can I can have the advantage here. That'll give us a way to just reshuffle the map and maybe give the, the area a take for someone who played it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark area for um, when you'd want th when you'd want the PDF version to be out at least. I know that with the with um the print version, that's going to be a bit more difficult. Yeah, so the Kickstarter is set and on February 9th right now, and once that ends. Kickstarter usually takes 14 days, unless it's changed to 21. I'm assuming it's 14 right now, but that'll be the end of February when the pledges are collected. By the time the pledges are collected, I expect to have uh, all the digital. I, I, I expect to have the plot project completely ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so my my idea is release F in last week of February or first week of March depending on how long Kickstarter takes to get the the, the funding in. At, also at that time, I would begin to order the print version uh, from the printer. And I'm the, if you back digital and print copy or copy back a level, I'm paying for the printing and shipping. The, the $60 pledge versus the $13 pledge is essentially the $13 plus printing and shipping there. Um, I know I do have a set uh, cost for the backer level at sixty dollars. So the plan is to, if you are on a, if you're in a location where the printer can get to you easily, the money allocated towards your shipping will go to a a more expedited shipping. If you're somewhere more remote, they have to just stuck with the basic shipping, allotting a certain amount. Mm -hmm. um, but but I I would hope that if I order the uh, the print versions early March that by the end of April, everyone would have their uh, print versions. But I did put on the Kickstarter June just in case anything anything happened, any unexpected issue comes up. I don't see why I wouldn't have them uh, delivered by June. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. I want to thank you for having me. I've had a great time on here, and I can't wait to hear more of your interviews with other creators out there. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Amen. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>